Hello, my name is Dr. Carl Candlepot, and this is the orientation film for the Lost series of videos here on this channel. The channel was originally designed as a resource where Lost fans could come to understand the unique mysteries and ideas emanating from the six seasons of the show. Not long after the series began, however, there was a spoiler. And since that time, the following protocol has been observed. At the start of every video, a spoiler warning must be issued, utmost importance, that once the warning is shown, if you have not seen through the indicated episode, you exit the channel in a timely fashion. Namaste and good luck. Hey everyone, um, as you've probably surmised already, today's topic is going to be all about the Egyptian community that once settled the island. I wasn't planning on addressing this subject anytime in the near future, however, over the past several weeks I've seen it being brought up quite a bit on Reddit. And after writing several of my trademark extensive comments, I decided to move this topic to the top of my long list of video ideas. So where does this culture's arrival fall on the timeline of the island's history? What was their society like? What was their ultimate fate? These are all questions I plan on addressing today. If you happen to enjoy this video and would like to support the channel, you can become a Patreon donor for as little as $1 a month. Or you can support it for free by simply liking, subscribing, and or sharing this video. If you know other Lost fans that might enjoy this channel, please do share it with them. As always, if you have any thoughts about this video, be it questions or alternate theories, or if you have a suggestion for a topic you'd like to see a video on, please do comment those things below. But for now, let's get lost. Throughout the back half of the series, we see several man-made structures seeming to originate from an ancient Egyptian civilization. These include the Statue of Tarot, the Summoning Chamber, the Frozen Donkey Wheel, the underground network of tunnels, the lighthouse, and the temple and its surrounding wall. Even the packaging for the complete series collection leans heavily into the Egyptian aesthetic. Yet, for all of their implied significance to the series, we never once see the civilization on screen. One commonly accepted reason for this is that they simply were not relevant to the overall story because they had already come and gone before the earliest point we ever see in the show, which is the day Jacob and his brother are born in the episode Across the Sea. The logic behind this reasoning seems to be primarily based on the fact that ancient Egyptian culture predates ancient Rome considerably and the unborn twins clearly arrived with Romans. This is evidenced by the speaking of Latin. Their mother's name being Claudia. And the fact that the dagger the man in black carries is Roman in design and depicts Romulus and Ramus, the mythical founders of Rome. So the assumption that the Egyptians' arrival on the island predates the events of this episode appears sound at first glance. But the truth is, there is actually an overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest the Egyptians arrived after this. First, let's address the main reason for the previous assumption. 
Ancient Egypt did indeed exist thousands of years before ancient Rome. In fact, the height of their power and influence ended centuries before the city of Rome was even born. However, what many people seem to fail to consider is that ancient Egyptian culture was around well into the Roman Empire. After Octavian's defeat of Mark Antony and Cleopatra in the year 30 BC, Egypt became a province of Rome for nearly seven centuries. So it's just as possible that a group of Egyptians might have fled Roman rule in search of a new land where they could hope to return to the glory of their ancestors. But obviously this just establishes an alternative possibility. We still need to prove it's the more likely scenario. So allow me to present several pieces of evidence, some more compelling than others, but that once put together suggest a pretty compelling story. Let's start by noting that of all these Egyptian-made structures and landmarks, none of them are seen in the Across the Sea episode, with one notable exception. We see the man in black building this wheel with the express purpose of leaving the island. What is that? It's a wheel. We're going to make an opening. One much bigger than this one. And then I'm going to attach that wheel to a system we're building. A system that channels the water and the light. And then I'm going to turn it. And when I do, I'll finally be able to leave this place. When Mother finds out about it, she incapacitates her son, massacres his village, and fills in the well so as to prevent its completion. Except, we know it does get completed. By none other than the Egyptians. This one piece of evidence alone establishes beyond any reasonable doubt that the Egyptians came to the island after the events of this episode. But let's not stop there. We have several more fascinating pieces of this puzzle to put together. Let's move on to what Ben discovers beneath the temple in the episode Dead is Dead. It appears to be an altar of some kind. And above this altar, Ben studies a depiction of the smoke monster communing with Anubis, the Egyptian god of death. Many people who think the Egyptians were around on the island before Jacob see this depiction as an indication that there was another smoke monster besides MIB. But as we've just established by investigating the timeline, the monster depicted is most definitely the man in black. What becomes clear from this image is that these people had some sort of relationship with the smoke monster and even associated it with death. Such a relationship is further evidenced by the existence of a chamber whose sole purpose seems to be to summon the monster. be outside. Now let's talk about the tunnels. Throughout the series, we see the monster emerge from underground. Our first clue as to why this is came on the blast door map. On it, there were several points labeled Cerberus Vents. Cerberus being Dharma's name for the monster, taken from the three-headed dog in Greek mythology responsible for guarding the underworld. By the end of Season 5, it becomes clear that these so-called vents are the Egyptian-built system of tunnels that spanned a vast portion of the island. Mm -hmm. 
So let's do a quick recap. These people built an altar depicting Smokey interacting with one of their most respected gods. They built a chamber where they could summon him. They completed building the wheel that he himself had designed. And they built the network of tunnels that he uses to navigate the island. Considering all of this, it seems incredibly likely that these Egyptians worshipped the man in black. And when you take into account their beliefs, it's not hard to imagine why. Ancient Egyptian culture placed a very high value on funerary rituals and the afterlife. So imagine a group of them arriving on an island and discovering a being that could seemingly summon the dead from the afterlife. I think most ancient civilizations would come to worship such a being, let alone one so obsessed with death. Now, before I dive fully into theorizing mode, let's go over a couple more facts. Here's the source as we see it in the episode Across the Sea. Now here it is in the series finale, set in 2007. Note how much dimmer the light is. Now, here is the plug-like stone Desmond finds at the source in 2007. Note the writing is a combination of cuneiform and Egyptian hieroglyphics. And now I'd like to direct your attention to this exchange between showrunners Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse on the audio commentary for Across the Sea. Right. And, you know, I do think one thing worth mentioning here that is informative on a commentary now that we're into it is that it seems like the golden light is much brighter in this episode here yes. than it is in the finale, Carlton. So yes. if, if I were to have a theory... That, yes. that apparatus that we see in the finale with the with the stone sticking in the middle of the pool that's quite sort of blocking the light. Yes. Maybe that, that apparatus wasn't created until after this event. I think that's an incredibly likely deduction. Dana. It's possible that people went down there and basically... Um, some people actually think something. that the light went... And lastly, note that when the source was at its brightest, the man in black was almost immediately ripped from his body upon entering the cavern. Save. while his body ended up in a stream not far away. <laughs> Yet somehow, people made it down here to build the pool and implement the plug. Granted, it did seem to result in at least some of their deaths. And now I'd like to bring up a question you may or may not have asked at some point. It may seem off topic, but I assure you it is in fact related. In Across the Sea, Jacob doesn't try to stop the man in black from leaving the island. Come with me, Jacob. Please. I don't want to leave this island. It's my home. Oh, it's not mine. Then later, out of anger, he actually tells his brother to leave. To find the light. You want to leave this place, brother? Then go. Chronologically, the next time period we see them interact in is 1867. They have the following exchange. I don't want to leave. Just let me leave, Jacob. As long as I'm alive, you're not going anywhere. Clearly, brotherly love is not the reason Jacob is keeping the man in black from leaving. Combine that with the speech he gives Richard around this time. Think of this wine as what you keep calling hell. There's many other names for it, too. Malevolence. Evil. Darkness. And here it is, swirling around in the bottle, unable to get out, because if it did, it would spread. Cork is this island. And it's the only thing keeping the darkness where it belongs. Such a description of the island was never given to Jacob by mother, nor did the job she laid out for him have anything to do with keeping evil contained. So what happened between mother's death and Richard's arrival in 1867 that changed Jacob's description of his perceived duties and made him so resolutely against his brother leaving? Well, now that we've asked all the questions and reviewed all the facts, 
Let's see if we can come up with an explanation that ties it all together in a satisfying way. Let's start by considering the man in black's relation to the source after being tossed into it. We know for certain there is some level of correlation between the two due to the fact that once the source is negated, he has returned to a flesh and blood form. Because of this demonstrated connection, I propose that it is the source itself that keeps the man in black tethered to the island. Think of the monster as a force that can only operate within the magnetic field of the source. He can therefore only travel within the radius of the island so long as the source remains active. I think he perhaps discovered this upon the wheel being completed. This of course being the explanation for why he couldn't simply turn it to escape. So the key takeaway here is that because of Jacob tossing him into the source, the only way he can leave the island is by figuring out how to manipulate the source. We'll come back to this shortly. We've established the extreme likelihood that the Egyptians followed the man in black as a god. This would highly suggest that the temple was originally built to worship him. And considering what we've seen the temple spring do, I think it's fair to say it played a pivotal role in whatever rituals were done there. Furthermore, if the temple was truly built to worship the monster, I think the next logical conclusion is that what we see happen to Saeed in Season 6 is exactly what the spring's original purpose was. This would mean that at some point before or shortly after Jacob's followers took over the temple, Jacob would have used his abilities to keep MIB's infective influence at bay within the spring while retaining its restorative properties. This is seemingly hinted at when Richard warns about the potential side effects of taking young Ben to the temple to be healed. If I take him, he's not ever going to be the same again. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that he'll forget this ever happened and that his innocence will be gone. I believe this is because there are still trace amounts of this dark influence left in the water. This also helps us to understand what happened with Saeed. The spring did not magically change its nature into an entirely new thing. Instead, it merely reverted to its original nature once Jacob died and could no longer keep the darkness at bay. I think Jacob knew this was a risk when he told Hurley to take Saeed there, but he was hoping the darkness hadn't fully re-emerged yet. You can even see him weighing this risk quite carefully before telling Hurley to go to the temple. Can you hear me? Why are you answering my questions? But what is the nature of this infection exactly? I plan to get into that more deeply in another video, along with which characters we've seen infected over the course of the series. For now though, if we look at the existing evidence, it seems that once a person is on the verge of death, they can accept the Man in Black's healing of them, but with the steep price of allowing his influence into their soul. Notice how in Saeed's case, Dogen and Lennon ask who is responsible for his condition. Once Jack takes responsibility, they inform him there are risks and ask for his consent, since Saeed is unable to give his. We did this to him. My fault. I, I didn't shoot him, but it's my fault. If we do this, there are risks. You understand? Do what you have to do. Very similar to the way Richard asked for Sawyer's and Kate's when Ben is unable to give his consent. You still want me to take him? Yes. But back to the Egyptians. Imagine for a moment the power such a ritual would have on a society like this one. A willing participant is fatally wounded, either by themselves or some sort of priest. They are then submerged in the sacred spring and emerge reborn, miraculously healed. If they weren't zealots already, they would almost certainly be now. But why would the man in black bother infecting these people that already follow him devoutly? Well, because some of the things he needs them to do even the most fanatical follower might balk at. Slaving away on the tunnels, perhaps in search of more pockets of energy, might be one such thing. However, I think the truly horrific fate was reserved for those sent into the source. Jacob had taken the man in black there, and as a result, I think he was still capable of finding it at this time. I think he was also capable of shielding the workers from the source to a certain degree. Enough so that they wouldn't be ripped from their bodies, but not enough to be spared horrible pain and suffering and terrible nosebleeds. I think it's safe to assume the skeletons we see down there 
died from the same type of hemorrhaging we see in similar circumstances. If you drill even one centimeter further, you risk releasing that energy. If that were to happen, God help us all. But of course, this would matter very little to the man in black. Even when he was still human, he saw other people as little more than tools. They're greedy, manipulative, untrustworthy, and selfish. And why are you with them? That means to an end. I think his goal was to experiment with the energy, and in a way, the workers were guinea pigs. I think the purpose of the stone plug was to act as a dam in an attempt to maximize the energy. After all, if the man in black could increase the range of the source's magnetic field, he could then theoretically leave the island. However, not dissimilar to what happened with Dharma and the swan pocket of energy, the man in black's experiments resulted in the source being completely dependent on the plug, resulting in the dimmer light. Somewhere around here is when I believe Jacob became involved in what was going on. Over the several generations that this culture was living on the island, I think a small percentage of people were disturbed enough by what was going on that they fled to another part of the island, most likely coming into contact with Jacob. He would have cared for these people, sheltering them, providing for them, treating the sick and wounded. And when things reached such a critical stage where the man in black had to be dealt with directly, I think Jacob sent these people away from the island. Some version of this narrative seems to be suggested by the tapestry Jacob weaves and displays in his home beneath the statue. I highly encourage you to check out the Lost PD article regarding this tapestry for more information and translations of the Greek phrases and hieroglyphs. I will link that page in the description. For now, though, I'll share my brief interpretation of the story I believe the tapestry is telling. At the top, we see the winged eye of Horus hovering above nine human figures that appear to be worshipping him, while at the mercy of his seventeen tendril-like arms. On either side of these nine is a person on a throne. I believe this is meant to be the smoke monster, ruling over his subjects. The nine may even be those that were sacrificed to him for infection. The ones on the thrones I take for priests. It actually makes a lot of sense that these Egyptians would believe the man in black was Horus, as he was their god of kingship. In my opinion, it also adds another layer to the fact that Locke, with his own Horus Eye Scar, was MIB's final form. Moving on to the second layer of the tapestry, here we have seven people dancing to the music of a harpist. I interpret this as portraying the few people that fled the Man in Black's rule and their subsequent contentment in their life with Jacob, as well as his contentment with them. Next comes what I think is merely a depiction of these same refugees and their descendants, enjoying a peaceful and prosperous life, harvesting crops from the island. And last, we have an illustration of three ships departing the island. I believe this is the moment I spoke of already. The time had come to confront this false god, the fury of whom Jacob did not feel certain he could protect his people from. So he sent away the only community of people he had ever, or would ever, be a part of. I think up until this point, he was in denial that the black smoke that had emerged from the source was some version of his brother and thus, on some level, was avoiding confronting what he had turned him into. A monster in every sense of the word. But after things had reached such a point that they could no longer be ignored, I believe Jacob used his abilities to conceal the cave the way Mother once did, thus preventing the man in black from being able to negate the source in order to leave the island. Then came the confrontation. The first one in perhaps centuries. The first one since Jacob condemned his own brother to his current state of existence. I imagine the man in black argued that mother was insane, that her insistence that the light going out at the source would cause worldwide damage was nothing more than a delusion. I imagine Jacob responded by expressing that even if that were true, how could he ever let his brother leave now, knowing that nothing would stop him from doing to all of humanity what he had done to the Egyptian settlers. At this point, the man in black would have restated his belief that people are not worthy of such concern, that they are all violent, destructive, and corrupting by nature. Perhaps Jacob would have pointed out that this belief stems from the man in black's own true nature. It is this argument that I believe solidified their opposing philosophical views on humanity. In the end, I think Jacob made it clear his decision was final. Regardless of the veracity of Mother's assertions about the light, 
Jacob now had an all too real, all too proven, and all too literal reason to protect the source. As long as it remained active, the monster would be stuck, and the outside world would remain safe from his destructive influence. I think we can all imagine how enraged the man in black would have become at this point. Unable to physically harm Jacob, I submit that he then went into a murderous rampage, killing every man, woman, and child still living on the island. These people worshipped him as a deity and would have followed nearly any of his commands, including attempting to kill Jacob. But I believe in that moment, the truest form of revenge the man in black could take against Jacob was slaughtering these people he claimed to care about so much. The people he had chosen over his own brother. And thus, their ultimate dynamic was established. Jacob, intent on proving his brother wrong about humanity, yet unwilling to ever again get close to another group of people. And the man in black, unable to escape the source he was tethered to, and unable to negate it, while Jacob, and anyone who might take his place, remained alive to conceal it. As long as I'm alive, you're not going anywhere. Well, then now you know why I want to kill you. And I will kill you, Jacob. Even if you do, somebody else will take my place. Well, then I'll kill them, too. Well, I think this about covers it for today. This has been my attempt to establish the facts that show when the Egyptians arrived on the island relative to Jacob and MIB, as well as to review the evidence that this culture worshipped the man in black, and to use these things to try and deepen our understanding of the relationship between these two brothers. I hope you found it informative, and perhaps even entertaining or insightful. Until next time, namaste and good luck. Oh, hello there. If you're like me, you can't get enough of Lost. So if you'd like to be notified when more videos like this one arrive, just click right up here to subscribe. In the meantime, if you'd like to check out other videos like this one, just click right up here. Or if you'd like to check out a fun talk show filmed in an abandoned Dharma broadcast station, just click right over here. And as always, remember that this channel is like the island. It wants you to come back.